In the last lecture, I presented a very simple argument for the conclusion that photography is not a representational art. The argument had two premises and it took a very familiar form, which I called modus tollens. It is a valid argument form. So if the premises are true, the conclusion is true as well. This means that if you want to reject the conclusion, so if you disagree with that conclusion, then you need to reject or disagree with at least one of the premises. In Scruton's case, most people have accepted that the controversial bit of the argument is the second premise. It is the claim that photography does not allow for aesthetic interest in representation itself. Because think about it, there are so many aspects of photography as a practice that we can admire. So you can have three different photographers going out in the field and taking pictures of exactly the same group of animals. And you might admire only the pictures of photographer two. This is a familiar thing. You might just see that they are a better photographer. You might see that the way she approaches her subject matter, the way she thinks about light, the way she chooses the compositions, the way she develops the pictures, the way the pictures are enlarged and framed and hung next to one another in a gallery is magnificent. It really shows a keen eye, not just for the subject matter, the animals in question, but also attitudes about that subject matter, how people approach that subject matter. It might be a social commentary on the subject matter. All of these things we can say about a photographer, and that is what makes her great as a photographer. Wouldn't that be taking an aesthetic interest in the process of representing itself? In the same way that you can take an aesthetic interest in the way someone made a pot out of ceramics? It seems so. So do we not have here a straightforward rejection of Scruton's assumption that photography does not allow for aesthetic interest? But we should be careful because what we've just said is still compatible with Scruton's argument. The idea that in many actual photographs we take an aesthetic interest in representation doesn't preclude that the ideal photograph Scruton is interested in is still a completely mindless, mechanical, automatic process. You could think of photography as no more than a tool that is used by artists to communicate thoughts, feelings, or other kinds of ideas. But that wouldn't mean that photography as such is an artistic medium. It's still perfectly compatible to say that when we admire a photographer, for the aesthetically interesting ways she has used photography, we can still say that the photography itself is sort of a mute automatic tool. We would say this is a good work of art despite its being a photograph. In that way, we would say that the medium that she uses is not itself an artistic medium, this is not a representational art, photography, but she is using the photographic medium in an artistically interesting way. And that is precisely Scruton's conclusion about what happens in actual photographic practices. So he would say that actual photographers use the photographic medium in an artistically interesting way by somehow corrupting it, by somehow adding things to it such that suddenly aesthetically interesting processes become part of the final result. And so aesthetic interest in those works of art is surely possible. But many people have wanted to say where Scruton goes wrong is more fundamentally in denying that photography as a medium is an artistic medium. So what we should be looking for, if we really want to resist Scruton's conclusion, is a situation where we can confidently say that it must be possible to generate aesthetic quality through the photographic process itself. 
And if we think of photography as a purely mindless, automatic tool, that doesn't seem to be possible. So if you want to resist Scruton's argument by rejecting the second premise, so if you, in effect, want to assume that photography does, as such, allow for an aesthetic interest in representation, then you really need to refuse to accept Scruton's conception of the ideal photograph. You need to offer some kind of alternative way of looking at photography. Now, when Scruton talks about photography, when he describes it as a purely causal process, as mechanical and automatic, he almost takes that for granted. He thinks of it as somehow an obvious observation about how photography works. And that is exactly the point where we can start pushing back. And this is what Dawn Wilson has done in her work, where she really scrutinizes that ideal conception of a photograph and shows that in fact, there is an alternative way of thinking of the photographic process that doesn't obviously lead to the conclusion that it is purely automatic, purely mechanical. This way of thinking about photography is now known as the new theory of photography, contrasted with the old theory of photography that you find in Scruton's work. So the old theory starts with a very simple picture. A light image is formed on a surface and there it is somehow encoded, stored, registered. It could be through a chemical process, it could be an electrical process. But the idea is what we're talking about here is a purely sort of physical effect that light can have on some kind of bearer. Any human intervention at that stage of forming and storing the image would be a corruption of the photographic process. It can be done, but it wouldn't count as part of the photographic process. It would be something that is added to it. So the ideal photograph on this old conception of photography exists just there, where the light image is somehow stored or registered by some kind of bearer or surface. But Don Wilson brings out that this is actually not the most attractive way of thinking about what happens in photography. So what she says is that yes, that is a stage in the photographic process, but once we have a light image that is somehow stored or encoded, there still is a further step of what we could call processing the image. And again, this could be a traditional form of processing in a dark room with um, chemicals and photographic paper. Or you can think of this as uh, digital processing in a computer using software of various sorts. That processing of the image, Wilson suggests, is itself part of the photographic process. And it's only as a result of that processing of the stored image that a photograph arises. So only then do we have a photograph. It's the result of the processing of this recorded image. But that processing, and this is the key bit, isn't itself conceived of as necessarily mechanic or automatic. It's neutral with regard to what means we use to process the image. So maybe there are ways of processing a recorded image that are purely mechanical. Again, think about the Polaroid camera, where the um, stages between the registering of the image and the actual output, the Polaroid photograph, are purely chemical, purely mechanical. There is no human intervention there. Other processes, however, think about darkroom practices or think about the things you do in image manipulation software, involve lots of human intervention. They involve lots of decisions about how the final photograph is going to look. So what things am I going to highlight? What things am I going to burn, so make darker? What things am I going to cut out, leave out the picture or crop? All of these now can be conceived of as 
moments in the processing of the image. And these moments would be intentional decisions. They would be the result of creative or artistic choices. So the important contrast between these two conceptions of what the ideal photograph consists in is that the one places the photograph earlier in the process. So on the old conception, the photograph exists as soon as an image is registered or encoded. And we can accept that this is a purely optical, mechanical process that doesn't allow for any human intervention. On the new conception, on the other hand, the photograph is actually moved into the future, so to say, as the result of the processing of the registered image. And that conception of a processing of an image isn't a conception of a purely mechanical process. It's a neutral conception. It allows for a purely mechanical kind of processing, but it also allows for a kind of processing that is laden with all kinds of human decisions, creative choices, artistic considerations. So on this new conception of photography, we can say that this is a good work of art precisely because it is a good photograph. It is through the processing of this image that aesthetically interesting features are now manifest, and that is what we admire. So photography then would no longer be a mere tool in the hands of artists, it would be a genuinely artistic medium. And in that way, we can say that Scruton's second premise is false even if we're talking about photography as such, ideal photography. So that second premise was photography doesn't allow for aesthetic interest in representation itself. And we can now say that that is false. It does allow for that aesthetic interest, at least in those cases where in the processing of the image, human decisions came in, artistic choices were made. As soon as that happens, we can take an interest in precisely why the picture was processed in the way it is. And we can appreciate the creative reasons or aesthetic considerations that the artist somehow manifests in the resulting picture. And that is just to say that we appreciate this as a piece of photographic art.